we thank you, God, our Creator and Lord, that you give us work to do. Thank you for the work that you give us to do today. And we pr pray that in all the work that we do today, we may find joy as we work with you. Please uh, guide us, help us, in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Ecclesiastes is one of my favourite books in the Old Testament. Now, why is it my favourite book? Well, the van? Never mind. Uh, it's a rhetorical question. Yes, rhetorical question. Um, because it has to do with enjoyment. Enjoying and life. Enjoying life. And the secret of enjoying life. Um, I've noticed something funny in my lifetime. That's this. Um, years ago, if you'd go to a party, uh, so on, and you didn't know people, okay, who are you? Okay, John Kleinig, okay, where'd you come from? People would ask, maybe, uh, or uh, I grew up in the Brossa Valley, that kind of thing, and in church circles. The next question, where do you come from? Who is your no. father or fa mother, or uh, who you're related to, okay? Now that's the old question about your identity, but you, have you noticed what people do? I'm John Kleinig, what's the next question? What do you do? What do, you do? Yeah. Now that's very telling, because the assumption is... You do something. That you do something, and you, this puts a disadvantage if you're a student, or retired, or a housewife. I'm only a housewife? Never. Okay. What do uh, you think? Uh, so, I, I think students pretty okay. Yeah, yeah, we so students is much better now than it used to be. Yeah, um, physics and they go, oh yeah, physics. Oh yeah, physics, yeah. yes. Or people who are retired say, I was an engineer. No, that's that's very true. Right so. Now, the assumption here, there's two assumptions. One is that your identity, who you are, is determined by the job you have. Hmm. And deeper than that is the idea that uh, we make ourselves, create ourselves by the work we do. Because instead of it being our family, it's been... It's life. instead of our identity being given to us, is that it's something that we achieve for ourselves by our, what we do. And what lies behind that is a, a assumption about the importance of work. Despite all the Australian talk about uh, long weekend and bludging, the basic philosophy of Australians is that work is the most important thing in our lives. Yep. Uh, we're into happiness. And the assumption is that work makes you happy. Not directly, but you work in, to get, in order to get those things that make you happy. So happiness comes as a result of work. Now, if there's one book that puts that basic philosophy under scrutiny, it's the book of Ecclesiastes, um, The Value of Work. <coughs> okay, just have a look at the structure of the book. You have an introduction, there's a title. Um, uh, the title is this, The Words of the Teacher. Uh, Son of David, King of Jerusalem. Now it's interesting, the names there are Son of David, King of Jerusalem. Uh, if you add together the letters, in Hebrew the letters are also numbers. So Aleph is one, Baith is two, you know, in writing. Yep. So if you add together the letters that are there, you get the number of verses that are in Ecclesiastes. Huh. Is that purpose? Or? Oh, absolutely. Uh, they're interested in these kinds of stuff, the w uh, wisdom guys. Uh, you get the title, and then you get the motto. The motto is <coughs> Hevel Hevalim, uh, uh, Vanity of Vanities, or <coughs> Vapor of Vapors, Everything is Vapor. And then there's the question, what is the profit that a man gets from all the work that he does under the sun? I'm going to come back to those because they're two key things. Uh, 
There's the question, there's the motto first of all, and then there is the question that the motto is, is a part answer to, or, and then uh, you get a, a poem about human lot. The human lot. The fact that we live in a world uh, which we don't control. Uh, then you get an introduction, uh, 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 the investigations of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, if you like, is a philosopher or a, uh, uh, a researcher, and he wants to examine the profit from work. And there's two kinds of things that he's interested in, as, as he says in the introduction. He wants to, to discover the profit from physical work we do, and secondly, he wants to look at the profit from mental work we do, wisdom. So work and wisdom, that connection. Uh, then uh, the first part of the book deals with the profit that comes from work. Now he's thinking of the kind of work, say, of a farmer or a businessman or a craftsman. Now work with your hands. Um, and then uh, uh, he, uh, the second part of the main part of Ecclesiastes deals with the prophet from um, wisdom. That's reflection on work. Uh, not, not working with your hands, but working with your head. Brain work. And then comes the conclusion. There's a poem which calls for enjoyment. Not enjoyment occasionally, or not enjoyment on holidays or on the weekend, but enjoyment every moment of life. Sounds good. It's very good. And then there's a repetition of the motto about vanity of work, and then there's an editorial epilogue. Let's have a look at what the basic question of the book is. And you won't, you, you, you won't understand the book unless you see that every single line in the book deals with this question. Garth, can you read chapter 1, verse 3? What, do, <clears throat> what does a man gain from all his labour at which he toils under the sun? Righto. What does a man gain? Now, um, that's slightly misleading in English because it's quite obviously you gain quite a lot from your work, otherwise you wouldn't work. Oh. But the picture here is profit. And it's a kind of accounting. It's not what you gain from work, but at the end of the day, when you do your accounting, profit and loss, you know, there's stuff you gain and there's stuff that it costs. So, you know, you know in an accounting book, you have profit and loss. That's the picture here. Uh, at the end of the day, when you balance the books, do you make any profit from your work? That's a question of profit from work. Can you see the slight difference? Yep. It's very important that you see it's a question of profit. The extra you get from your work. Um, what's the profit of human work under the sun? Man here is Adam in Hebrew which means humanity, human being, Adam. Now to understand this book you need to uh, appreciate its cultural context and historical setting. Um, uh, Proverbs is old wisdom. Now going back to Solomon, and it marks a time w which was a huge cultural um, uh, shift in the ancient world, uh, uh, not just in Israel, but everywhere in the ancient world, uh, Proverbs was. And what uh, Proverbs was interested uh, in is the following. The original goal of wisdom and the wise men in the ancient world was how to adjust to God's, uh, uh, the God-given natural and social order for the enjoyment of his blessings. So it's basically a kind of an ecological, to put it in modern terms, it's the discovering of ecology. Um, how do you fit into the world so that you can enjoy the benefits of the world. Let me just give you uh, 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 two examples. Now, uh, going back to the period leading up to this time, people had this, uh, first of all, people used to hunt animals 
and then gather fruit what is grown wild and crops that are grown wild but then human beings learn to domesticate animals and they learn to domesticate uh, wheat and barley and fruit trees so that's wisdom uh, learning how to use the natural order for your advantage and that happens at all levels human beings learn to use the order God's order the natural order for their advantage now out of this comes and you'd be interested in Stephen the whole this is the beginnings of modern technology and science comes out of this uh, that has its origins and it happens at all levels uh, you know, the discovery, you know, initially, say, uh, human beings discovered that there was uh, copper that was nearly pure and that by beating that naturally occurring copper, you could make a, um, a, a sharp. tool, a sharp tool that was better than a stone axe. You could have a copper axe. But then what's the next step? Oh, more of this copper stuff. Ah, right. Oh, they learned to refine copper. And not just copper, but bronze. And so you have Bronze Age, and then you, you've, you learn to refine iron. Can you see there's that kind of using the natural order for your advantage? And the same was with, you know, human beings, human relationships, all that kind of stuff. Have you got the basic picture? That was the starting point. Now, um, they were so successful in this... Um, and it reached its peak, uh, you know, around about uh, seven, from the period from about 600 BC to 800 BC. And it's somewhere around about this time and later that Ecclesiastes comes, um, that uh, they developed what we would call technology, rational technology, uh, which enabled them to manipulate the natural world for personal gain in part of God. So instead of just fitting into nature, what did they do? They, they tried to control nature and they had the illusion that they, became God. they become gods. Or they didn't need God anymore because they were in charge of the natural world. And then this was carried over to human life. Instead of uh, life being a gift given from God, it's, it's something that you can control that you manage your own life, that you manage human beings, you manage society, you create your own world. Do you get the basic picture? Um, uh, so there was the belief in the human control of the world, and more than that, that, that happiness and enjoyment and fulfillment came as a result of controlling your world, your life, yourself, other human beings. And this is where you get, they started running into trouble. That happiness comes from controlling the world. No. Uh, now, Ecclesiastes criticizes <clears throat> this technological, and I use a modern word, he doesn't use this word, this technological approach to life with its focus on human performance and achievement rather than the ancient term fear of the Lord. Now, what's fear of the Lord? is respect for God and his, that he is the creator and he is in control. He manages things. And so you, f you, you begin to put your trust in human management of the world, uh, what we would call um, uh, science and politics. Have you got the basic picture? Uh, I can only do it very, very briefly. Um, when was this book written? We don't know. Um, the assumption is that it's somewhere between, say, 700 to 400 BC. So we, when we read Son of David, we don't assume it's Solomon. It's ascribed to Solomon. It's in that tradition, and it comes out of the school of Solomon, um, no, the, uh, uh, that royal school, yeah. right? So just as uh, we talk about the Psalms of David, but only a few, only some of the Psalms are written by David. Yep. Right? So it's, it's in that tradition. Or the law of Moses, even though uh, Moses didn't write all of the Pentateuch. Do you yep. get the way it is? Because it, it's ascribed to Moses. 
Now, what are the main themes of this very, very interesting, puzzling, uh, surprising book? Um, the first, the first uh, uh, theme is about the futility of human toil. Um, notice the motto, the question is, what, does, what profit does a human being gain from all the toil that he toils under the sun? Now what's important is under the sun, which means what profit do you get from your work while alive? Now what's the profit? And it's a question of most men my age. Now uh, in Australia, I'm about to retire. Most men my age have retired. They busted their gut and they sit then in retirement and they say, I've got nothing. The government took it all away. What? <laughs> what, have point? what have I got to show for it? What have I got to show for all that immense effort that I put into it? And because many men my age don't have what I have, they don't have an intact marriage, they've alienated their kids, they sit on a pile of cash, but they're worried about it because. That's all they have, and every day now with the economic slump, what happens to all their investments? It's disappearing. It's disappearing. It's disappearing daily. Um, and I know many guys my age look at the paper every day and they say, oh, I've lost another so-and-so. What was the point of all that work? Now, um, then there's one answer that's given, and that is in the, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. Can you read that, please, Levi? 1 verse 2. Yes. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Now, that is totally wrong translation. Oops. Uh, and it's typical of uh, 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 that particular age. It, it's, it says that there's no meaning to life and there's no meaning to work, and it's an intellectual problem. Now, that's not what it's on about. Oh. The word in Hebrew, not meaningless, is hevel. Hevel is a vapour, a puff of breath. I'll tell you what it is exactly. On cold morning, go out there and go like... <laughs> no, yeah. Right? What you have there is, is condensed vapour. So it's there and it's gone. What? It's there and it's gone. It's real. It's not meaningless. It's real. But what is it? <clears throat> only there for a small amount. It's only there for... It's insubstantial, it's passing, it's elusive. Okay, uh, it's something transitory, it's something elusive, it's something in, so it's a vapour puff of breath, uh, and then going beyond that, it's, uh, it's a word for nothingness, an illusion or a delusion or powerlessness or sometimes the idea of emptiness, but th that's not very close. It's best to stick to the picture rather than the abstract concept because it's a picture rather than an idea. Um, it's also used, very interestingly, to refer in a derogatory kind of way to an idol. An idol is like <sighs> the puff of breath, uh, the vapour. Now, the statement is the following. Hevel hevalim, everything is hevel. So, uh, vapor of vapors, everything is vapor. Now, it doesn't mean everything's meaningless. It means that everything, and everything here is referring by the next sentence. Not, it doesn't give a philosophical statement about the meaning of life and all that kind of stuff. But it's talking about the profit from work. So, work. What's the profit from work? It is Hevel, meaning what? It doesn't last. It doesn't last. You know, it's there. You actually create, do something, but what's the problem? It doesn't last. Uh, you can't take control of and possess and keep what you've created through your work. It's going to keep working. You've got to keep working. It's going to a bit longer. Yes. And you wear yourself out puffing. Yeah, now, um, then, okay, then, then there's, an, uh, uh, if I can, there's, there's, there's uh, three basic points that are made about work. Um, and I'll merely summarise. It's, it's quite complex. First of all, 
uh, there's a focus on the human inability to create happiness. Now, if you ask most people, why do you work so hard? I work hard to get a lot of money, good investments, so what do the de-investments money deliver to me? More money. More, no. Oh, happiness. So I work, I work for the long weekend. I work for the holiday. I work for retirement. I, don't, I work for happiness. Now, um, uh, Ecclesiastes has a look at that idea of working for happiness. Number one, uh, he, he touches on the elusiveness of happiness, that you can't create happiness. Happiness is not something you can pursue. Say, so I'm going to be happy. Have you noticed the more you try to be happy, the less well, happy you become? Um, uh, maybe you haven't lived long enough, but you put all your hopes on the holiday, it's and then what happens? It's never what it's cracked up to be. It's never what it's cracked up to be. And you're married, and you go on a holiday, and the kids bicker, and you fall out with your wife, and you look forward to getting back to work, to get away from it all. Uh, the happiness is elusive. You can't um, m make happiness. Yes? People, there's something that was a column in the paper a few years ago that was called the delayed happiness syndrome. Yes. And it's everyone's looking for just that next thing, just that next thing, yes. just that next thing. Yeah, and you start living. So students think that happiness is going to come when they graduate. graduate and then they look when they get married and then when they have kids. And then after they have kids, they'll be happy when the kids leave home. They'll, happy when they, they'll be happy when they retire. And finally, they'll be happy when they're six feet under. <laughs> uh, can you, that's, that's the point that Ecclesiastes is making. Um, the, and secondly, uh, it touches on the emptiness of the pursuit of pleasure. Now, we uh, identify happiness with pleasure. Um, pleasure from uh, things. But the, uh, 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 the problem is that the more you pursue pleasure, the more you empty, the less you enjoy the things you once enjoyed. So let's say, for example, I like a beer after a hard day's work. Oh, delicious, a beer, okay? Okay, then I forget about that and I merely get, try and get, replicate that enjoyment by drinking more beer and more beer and more beer. What happens? Okay. Exactly. And you, in fact, enjoy it more. Yeah. You enjoy it less. Yeah. Um, or the same thing with sex. If you make sex, sexual enjoyment your goal, the more you want to enjoy, get enjoyment out of sex, the more you empty the pleasure of sexuality. Uh, uh, then thirdly, he talks about the anxiety of wealth. Let's say you, 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 you uh, think that money is going to make happiness. And if you get enough, then you can enjoy life. The problem is that the more you have, the more you... Hmm? The more you want. It's not only the more you want, that's more that emptiness, the more you worry about it because you can lose it so easily. Okay, you've got it in shares, you've got to be checking the paper. That's oh, right. No, you, you, need, want you need more to... to just to make sure, you see, it's, it's, it's a con. It's a real con. It's a real con. But we say before about happiness, yep. um, but we also say to ourselves, we know that it's not going to bring us happiness, but... It is an illusion. We know it's not going to bring us happiness. Okay, but still, it's still we follow it. Yeah. And the worst thing of all, according to Ecclesiastes, is... Oh, your money's better than no money. Um, I don't know. Don't know. Not necessarily. Uh, the, the, the greatest problem that comes is with the pursuit of happiness and pleasure is that you lose the capacity for enjoyment. Uh, you end up like Howard Hughes, who was the uh, richest man in the world, but he was the most miserable coot. And it's interesting to, if you don't know about his story. Uh, he could no longer enjoy anything anymore, um, even physical things, even food. Lost all capacity for enjoyment. Now, the capacity for enjoyment is a funny thing. Uh, who enjoys most life most of all? Very often it's the people who have least. But it, that doesn't necessarily follow. You can have a capacity for happiness if you're wealthy or if you're poor. But not all people have a capacity for enjoyment. It's a strange thing. Do you know what I mean by capacity for enjoyment? The ability to enjoy things. 
Everybody eats, but not everybody enjoys eating. Everybody works, but only a few people enjoy their work. Capacity for enjoyment. That's what Ecclesiastes is interested in. And the second, second problem uh, about human work is uh, uh, the threats to uh, the work. You know, think in terms of a farmer or businessman, okay? You work to build up a farm. You work to create a business. What's the problem? Uh, problem is that you can have bad luck that hits you. Or uh, you can have injustice. Somebody uh, cheats you out of your business. And I know people who've lost their businesses, very good businesses, just by being conned or through injustice. Uh, uh, secondly, you can work, say, to build up your business and with a long-term career goal, but at any moment you can die. And what's the use of the business then that you've worked so hard to build up? And worse than that, okay, let's say you build up your business to hand on to your kids. And this is the sad story of many men in our society. They work hard for their children. What's the problem? The kids don't want the farm. The kids don't want the farm. They take it and they just... They abuse it. Everything that was built up so carefully. And I come from a rural community. I've heard that story again and again. Uh, uh, the, the son who's supposed to take over the farm isn't interested in farming, or if he does, he's not interested in caring for the farm. He just rips it off. No? Lastly, um, let's say you work in order to achieve something, to remember something. You know, I work hard. Uh, okay, I'm a scholar. I work hard to write books, and I want to make a reputation for myself and leave a memorial in terms of books. Okay, what's the problem? When I die, no, one no, but who's going, who's going to read them? Who's even going to remember who this... You know, they might, there might be a book in the library. They might read the book, but they won't know me. There's no relationship with the author. There's no relationship with the author. Can you see that? Yeah. Or you build up a farm, and then somebody else takes it over, and they won't remember it was you who made that farm or that business or whatever. So human beings will forget because, uh, yes. When I sometimes look at very old books in the library and read them and enjoy them, I yes. do, you, you just, sometimes I just say to myself, I wonder who, the, who this yes. person wants. Yes, what put a you? face behind it. And then, you know, you can't. That's it. That's it. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, the, the, the third problem is if you are going to work in, or, you know, if you're going to work to achieve something which is going to give you happiness, the problem is the unpredictability um, of the future, the, um, the human limitations in undertaking any pro, uh, uh, project. Um, number one is that you don't know the future. Let's say, for example, you build up a business, you don't know what the market's going to do, you don't know what the economic cycle's going to do, right? you can't predict the future. And even if you can predict the future, you don't know whether things are going to be good or bad for you. Now, say, if there is a boom, you can't predict how that's going to benefit you. Mm. Or um, if there is a bust, you can't understand, you can't predict where the new opportunities will arise, say, in the share market, with the economic slump. Or uh, new business opportunities after the depression. Lastly, uh, most of all, and this is from God's point of view, human beings are not in control. You can't, un you cannot uh, uh, know the way God is going to manage events. It's not just, you, what we can do is to, we can predict what we will do, and maybe we can guess what human beings will do in the future, but what can't we guess? What God's going to do. What God's going to do, ultimately. It's, it's a bit like you were saying about the plans of a person last week. Yes. A person uh, graduation, like yes. they adapt to the surroundings. That's right. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you don't get out of bed every morning. No. Because what I'm hearing is yes. yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's not negative. But. This is all positive and 
I could, no, and a lot of people only read it up to here and say, well, what's the use of it all? Now, what Ecclesiastes is doing is clearing the ground for something amazing. Um, now, put it quite simple. Uh, what Ecclesiastes comes to is then seven counsels for enjoyment, the secrets of enjoyment. Um, uh, and to put it in a nutshell, most human beings um, do what they do in order to get something that will make them happy. The secret for enjoyment is not to look at the future, to what you can get out of work, out of possessions, but to enjoy work, to find enjoyment. Let's have a look at the seven councils of enjoyment. I reckon that in the future, here in Australia, you would do well to do quite, use this to do quite a lot of teaching for people, particularly men who are involved in work. Um, Tony, let's start off with the first count of the seven councils of enjoyment. 20, 24 to 26. Yes, here, this one. 2, 24 to 26. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. Just stop there. Hebrew is not find satisfaction, uh, but what is good. A man can do nothing better than eat and drink and find what is good in his work. Now, a finding what's good in his work means that there is something good in work, but it's hidden. And unless you look for it, you won't find it. So... There's nothing better than to eat and drink and find what's good in your work. Now that summarizes the whole book. Keep going. Now that's unpacked a bit further. This too I see is from the hand of God. What's from the hand of God? Enjoyable work. Yeah, keep going because it's explained there. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? Mm -hmm. To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge and happiness. But to the sinner he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too, and it says meaningless. This too is a vapour. A chasing after the wind. Now that explains chasing after the wind. The wind's real, but you can't get it. Now the word here that's translated as happiness is, is modern and it's wrong. It's, uh, the verb is samach which means to rejoice. And simcha is rejoicing joy. So uh, uh, God enables people to find enjoyment. To the man who pleases God, God gives wisdom, knowledge and joy. Now, uh, wisdom and knowledge, the greatest wisdom and knowledge that you can have is the finding of joy. Can I repeat that? The, the purpose of wisdom in knowledge is not for you to control your life and people in order to create happiness from yourself, but the purpose of all wisdom and knowledge is to discover what's good in your work and to enjoy your work and to enjoy your leisure. Which means work leisure, that's every day. You work and you have you have meals and you have work to enjoy that. That's wisdom. So the wise person is the person who finds that and that's a gift from God. Now, um, what is the mark of a foolish person? Well, a foolish person is a person, uh, if, if somebody doesn't please God, doesn't do fit into God's plans of things, uh, they work and they work and they work, but they, what don't they get? Enjoy. Enjoyment. They work in order to hand what the, the results of what they've done to people after them. Um, uh, and then the people after them find no joy in it and it keeps going. It might go to the, the people who have wisdom. That goes to the people who have wisdom no. and joy. That's, that can go either way. Let's have a look at the next passage. Uh, uh, very, very famous. Now, whose turn to read? Yes, uh, Stephen. Um, uh, first of all, 3 verse 1. There is a time for everything 
Now the season for every activity under heaven. Now, notice there's a time for everything here, uh, uh, a season for every activity. Everything is every task, every kind of work. So uh, now it comes, what here is, is, is what's touched on is the fact that there are seasons and times both for work and enjoyment. Now what are the seasons for work and enjoyment, Stephen? Uh, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war the time for peace. Verse, read verse 9 and then 2. What does the worker gain from his toil? Okay, given the fact that there are times and seasons for work, what is the profit that a worker gains from all his work? Now comes something really interesting. Can you read the next uh, uh, two verses please, Stephen? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from, from beginning to end. Now, just stop there. Now, this is, uh, uh, yeah, there. God has made everything beautiful or enjoyable in its time. Now, what's... Uh, uh, Ecclesiastes saying here there's certain things that are given for you to do when you are an eight year old and there's certain things that you can enjoy when you're an eight year old they are not the same as a 15 year old or a 20 year old or a 30 year old and so on um, so there are certain things to do at certain times of life and there's certain enjoyments. There's nothing sadder, say, than to see a, 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 a older person who tries to chase the enjoyments of teenagehood. So you'll get a woman in her 40s who acts as if she is 18, mutton dressed as lamb. Um, it's sick. It's sick. Uh, there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with lamb. Were you? Okay, we are the same generation, Tony. Uh, so everything is beautiful in its time. Everything is enjoyable in its time. But now what's the problem? God has set eternity in the hearts of men. Uh, and what's the problem? He set eternity in the hearts of men. Um, how does it go on? Um, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Now what's the point here is this. Um, whenever you enjoy something, you want it to last forever. forever. Um, and when, whenever you have something bad, you want it to stop. But enjoyment always is uh, you want it to last forever. Now, why has God given people bits of enjoyment rather than uh, uninterrupted periods of enjoyment? Yep. Because if they enjoyed it all the time, they wouldn't enjoy it anymore. Right. Number one is because they would try and possess it. And as soon as you try and possess it, you lose it. You can only receive it. But I think there's something deeper than that. Uh, God gives people bits of enjoyment in this life to whet their, their, their appetite for heaven. heaven, perpetual enjoyment. So every joy that God gives us here on earth is a foretaste of heaven and to whet our appetite for heaven. We've got this yearning for eternity in our hearts. Do you understand? It's a very profound point. Uh, that we're not satisfied just with passing 
enjoyment. We want eternal enjoyment. And God wants to give us lasting enjoyment. And that's the point of it. Okay, then the conclusion of this, Stephen? I know that there is nothing better for man than to be happy and do good while they live. That everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. Be happy is wrong, it's to rejoice. There's nothing better for a man than, if this is true, than just to enjoy food and drink and work. Um, to find, to experience what's good in his work. Um, that's the gift of God to people here on earth. And it's God's gift to us here and now, which is to whet our appetite for better things to come. But it's not just for heaven. The enjoyment that you have when you're a teenager is meant to whet your appetite for the enjoyment of God that lies, the enjoyment of life that lies ahead. Yeah, and what this means <clears throat> that whatever good things you've enjoyed, God still has something better, better ahead for you. That turns our whole modern philosophy upside down because we think young people have everything to enjoy and the older you get, the less you have to yeah. enjoy. Dylan? I have experienced that very briefly, sort of. Yes. Well, I have experienced yes. that. But I, I remember about four years ago when Marinda and I were um, just lying on the trampoline talking to each other in yes. my backyard. Yes. And she said to me, I hope we stay this age forever, Dylan. I, yes. I wish we could stay this age forever. Yes. Because we're so happy. Yes. And then just earlier this year when we were on a holiday down here in the Barossa yes. and we were talking, she said, I wish we could stay this day forever, Dylan, because yes. we're so happy at the moment. And I said, do you remember you asked, yes. told me that same thing four years ago? Yes. And she said, oh yeah, yeah, she, I, re I told her where, where it was, where we yes. were. She yes. said, oh yeah, I remember. Yes. And I yes. said, would you go back now? Yes. She said, no way. No. Wouldn't change. Okay, anything. that's the point. Can you see? Um, all of us, uh, if you live a, a normal good life, um, experience that. Um, now, the next council of enjoyment, um, no, as if this is not good enough, it still gets better. 3 verse 22, a very short one. It's a basically a summary of um, what's there, but there's a whole new idea. 3 verse 22, please, yes. So I saw that there is nothing better than that. Nothing better than that all should enjoy their work, for that is their lot. Who can bring them to see what will be after them? What's, uh, there's nothing better than that all human beings should enjoy, rejoice in their work. Now the focus is on work, and that is their lot. Now I want to explain to you what this idea of lot is, because it's very important, and it's very important in our Luther's theology. Now, originally, Lot was the portion of land, God's land, that God gave to his people in order to give his blessings to them. Okay. So my Lot was my, the family farm. Now, Ecclesiastes takes this across and says that God doesn't just allot land to us, physical things to us, but he allots a lifespan to us and work and work to us. So he gives us an allotted task. It's our purpose. What's the purpose of, of the allotted task, the work? To enjoy. To enjoy. To enjoy it now. Not to, and not to enjoy it in the future, but to enjoy it now. Also, then I assume to glorify God through it. It's by enjoying it you glorify God. Oh. Because you're working with God. God likes working. <laughs> I don't know, have any of you, have any of you had a father or worked with a guy who actually enjoys his work? Yeah, like okay, your dad's like that, and what, the fact that he likes his work, and if you work with him, what, you learn not only just to do the work, but what do you learn? To enjoy it. Enjoyment, and you share that enjoyment, and he enjoys, say, working by himself, he enjoys it, but what happens then, Dylan, when you're working with him? Wow. He enjoys the work, but he also enjoys you, and he enjoys, if you enjoy it... He enjoys your enjoyment. Okay, it more than doubles his enjoyment. It's a relationship. It's, it's more than just the relationship. It is, it is the joy. It's, it's that there's a great joy. Just as when you were lying on that trampoline, it wasn't work, but 
Uh, Shared, <laughs> shared, yeah, I don't know. Okay, I won't judge that. But shared joy is double joy. Can you, the funny thing about joy is that it's shared. Now, most men in our society, what they enjoy most of all is working together with other men. men. Okay, this is God's plan. He gives us work to do, not for the sake of what we get out of work, but to give us enjoyment in work. And who's the wise person? The one who enjoys it. Right, oh, that one who enjoys what he's doing right now. So enjoying Hebrew, instead of just doing Hebrew for the sake of uh, uh, other things. Uh, now, 5, 18 to 20 talks about, uh, gives another dimension to this whole issue. Dylan, you've got the privilege of reading this, and it, it also exemplifies um, those two experiences that you had. 18 to 20? 18 to 20. I'll tell you to pause at various places. Yeah. Then I realized that it, that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him. For this is his lot. Now what's his lot is to eat and drink and not find satisfaction but find, discover what is good in his work. So, um, so God's lot is not only to give you food and to give you work, but to give you enjoyment in your work. And uh, I realize that this is good and proper. Uh, the Hebrew is actually beautiful. This is the good and beautiful thing or enjoyable thing. This. Uh, keep going then. 19. 19 by itself. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. Now, what's the great... Every God gives work and wealth and possessions to every person. But what is it that God only gives to some? The ability to enjoy it. The ability to enjoy these things. And the ability to enjoy these things comes... Only if you accept your lot. If I always think, instead of enjoying my work, think, oh, if only I could have that job or do that, then I'll never enjoy my work. Even if you so, have a job. Even if I have a job. So uh, God gives three things. He gives the, uh, not just possessions, but the ability to enjoy them, the capacity to enjoy them, and secondly, the capacity to accept your lot whatever that is, and most importantly, to be happy or to rejoice in your work. So God gives uh, acceptance and the capacity for enjoyment. Now, uh, the last point, which is, which is a, an interesting phenomena. He seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. I don't, he seldom reflects, uh, uh, the Hebrew is notices or remembers the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness. Have you noticed a strange phenomena? When you're enjoying what you're doing, when you're preoccupied, utterly engrossed in what you do, what happens? Time, Time flies. Time flies. Yeah. And you don't know whether it is five minutes or an hour. I had that, yes, had that yesterday, I sat down for a period of time and I was really enjoying it and I thought, oh, that's about five minutes. I looked at my watch, it was one and a half hours. <laughs> Holy moly. Right? Now, uh, yeah. and see that what happens, so it's, when it comes to enjoyment, it's not the amount of enjoy, things you enjoy or the length of life for enjoyment. What counts is not the quantity but the quality. quality. And this is the greatest gift of God, is that you can enjoy work particularly so much that it doesn't matter whether you have a long life or short life. Isn't that great? Yeah, Dylan? A teacher in high school gave me some wisdom on that topic. Uh, he said, what did he, what did he say? Uh, an hour with a hot woman can seem like a minute, but a minute with your hand on a hot plate will seem like an hour. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, 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 <laughs> 
I'm not too sure about the uh, 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 exactly about that, but it, it's that's the general idea. Uh, next passage, uh, eight verse fifteen. Coming back to you, Garth. Uh, but that's true. <laughs> Hot in a good sense. Yeah. Yes. Shake it, shake it. So I commend the enjoyment of life, because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany him in his work all the days of his life. God has given him under the sun. Now, joy will accompany him is a very concrete picture. Um, uh, rejoicing will be like a wreath or a crown on his head every single day of his life. Now, what's the point here? In the ancient world, people had particular times of rejoicing. They were the great festivals, the holidays. So, uh, uh, Passover, tabernacles, times of rejoicing, weddings, uh, no, happy occasions. You have times of rejoicing. But uh, Ecclesiastes said here, God doesn't just want to give us occasional times of rejoicing, but what does he want to do? He wants to give us joy for the whole of our life. And the whole of our life is a festival, is feasting, is rejoicing, is, to put it crudely, party time. Uh, so uh, we are not just to celebrate and rejoice occasionally, but God wants to, God's plan is to turn our whole life into festivity, into rejoicing. Now, um, uh, uh, let's have a look at the next one, as if that's not uh, bad enough. What hap what's the counsel, then, that's given if this is God's purpose? Uh, who's next? Oh, Levi, Levi, Levi. Chapter 9, 7 through to 10. Just read 7 and 8, first of all. Pages... 7 and 8. Yeah, 7 and 8. Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for it is now that God favours what you do. What does God favour? He favours the fact that you eat your food with gladness and eat, drink your wine with a joyful heart. Now, uh, quite often people uh, uh, do things with a bad conscience. What Ecclesiastes is saying, if God gives you food to eat and wine to drink, it means that God wants you to do what? Eat and drink it. Not just eat and drink it, but to enjoy eating and drinking it. God favours it, and it's a mark of God's favour. Okay? How do you know God's pleased with you, your work, your life? It's not, to, not that he just gives you work and food and wine to drink, but that he gives you enjoyment. enjoyment. And don't have a bad conscience about it. Enjoying it. Keep going. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. Now that picks up the point from the last uh, uh, passage. When did people dress in white and put a uh, perfume, oil perfume on their head? Festival. Festival. So hmm. always live as if it's festival time, party time. Um, and who are you to party with? Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless, this vaporous life. Yes, that God fleeting has. life. Yeah, fleeting life. Is a stupid it's word. stupid, isn't it? Can you see how wrong it is? It's fleeting it's life. Hat. Yes. Keep going. That God has given you under the sun, all your fleeting days. For this is your lot in life, and in your toilsome labour under the sun. Right, uh, if God gives you a wife, what's one of the purposes in God giving you a spouse? Enjoy life with her. With her, because enjoyed, uh, uh, enjoyed, uh, shared work, shared eating and drinking is doubled. Maybe I, I think it's more than double. It's squared enjoyment. I feel sorry for yes. Actually, there's, a, there's a really good scripture somewhere else that says an inheritance. That's the cash we're talking yes. about. Yes. fleeing. Cash is inherited from parents, but a good wife is from the Lord. That's Proverbs. Yeah, he yeah. Finds, a good wife. He finds a wife, finds something good, and gains favour from the Lord. That's the same thing again. Okay. <laughs> okay, yes, here now, and then the last part. If that's the case, then, verse 10. 
Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Now that is just so wise. If there's something that I would urge you, guys, this stage of your life, whatever you do, do it with all that, put everything that you have into it. Don't do anything half-heartedly. Uh, what's the secret of enjoyment of work? Getting as much out of it as you can. And you, you, okay, you, for, to get the much out of it, you've got to put everything into it. You've got to put yourself into it. You can't do work out here, and you here, you put yourself into it. You do it with all your might. And why do you um, uh, do it with all your might? Well, you won't have it forever. Uh, make the most of it while it's here at this time. Uh, the next uh, council of enjoyment is geared particularly to you young guys. Um, chapter 9, 7 to 10. Uh, who's next? I think... Yeah, we just read that. Just read that one. Chapter 9, 7 to 10. Uh, oh, it's chapter... Yeah, it's chapter uh, uh, 11, verse 7. Uh, just verse... I want to read verse 7 and then through to 10. Dylan, is your turn? Oh, is it we've gone? Garth, he just had we going that way. Okay, you please, just uh, 11 verse 7. Stop bumbling around. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go on, Dad. is sweet and it pleases the eye to see the sun. Okay, now what's the point here is um, it's a little proverb uh, that, light is, sweet, that uh, light is sweet and enjoyable. The sunshine is warm. But you don't have to work to enjoy light. It's given as a gift. It's there. It's there. And it's not there occasionally, but it's there all the day. All the time. Um, and it doesn't depend on you. What's the only thing that you need to do? Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Please. To be pleased in it. Not just to receive it, but to enjoy receiving it. So. You don't create the sun, you don't create the light, you don't create the enjoyment that comes from warmth and sunshine and light. All you do is receive it. Yes? But if, it's, if, if there's darkness, it's you know, you're stuffed anyway. Yes, and, and if you don't enjoy the sun, you can't enjoy, and if there's no sun there, you can't enjoy anything else. Sure. Okay, now let's go on. We'll take this bit by bit. Verse... Uh, 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 eight, first of all. However many years, however many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. Rejoice in them, I think is better than enjoy, right. but still, yeah. But let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything to come is vapor. His vapor is fleeting. So uh, enjoy not just the future. That's where we're usually looking for enjoyment. But however long your life is, enjoy every day. Why? Because death is long. You'll die. And what's more, uh, uh, everything is fleeting. Nothing lasts. If you, don't, if you don't enjoy the gifts that God gives you today, you won't receive them tomorrow. Well, you won't see them tomorrow. You won't see them tomorrow, so you can't enjoy them tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. The things that God gives you to, to enjoy today are for today, not tomorrow. Okay, well then, what about you young guys? And we old guys, we're going to give you a bit of advice here now. Come on, Tony. Well, I've got to be happy. Is that it's, that's rejoice, not be happy. That's stupid. <laughs> Isn't it though? It's so <laughs> rejoice, yes. young man, while you are young. And let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Now, one of the saddest things about life is that the people who should enjoy life most of all, I find, are the most miserable. Is that us or the old folks? No, teenagers are some of the most unhappy people the emos. <laughs> in society. Yeah. And yet, from our point of view, we look back and say, oh, these silly teenagers, they should enjoy life. Now, what's the problem? So, uh, young people, the secret is to start off rejoicing when you're young. Um, uh, keep Go on. Keep going then. the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see. Now, whatever your eyes see means whatever God gives you to enjoy, enjoy. Yep, that tree, that's fine. 
Yep, enjoy that tree. I will. <laughs> uh, that woman looks good. Enjoy seeing her. Um, now, the next one, in Hebrew, there's no but. Just put and. Yeah. Uh, and know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. Okay, for what things will God bring you to judgment? This well, the rabbis put it beautifully. It's not that God will bring you into judgment because of your, just because of your sins. But on judgment day, the rabbis say that God will call you a uh, to account for all the good things that he gave you to enjoy and you did not not enjoy. Oops. Can I repeat that again? On judgment day, you will be called to account, to give account to God for all the good gifts, all the good things that God gave you to enjoy and you spurned them. You get to God. I didn't see that. <laughs> okay, you didn't see that. Isn't that astonishing? Uh, you won't find that teaching anywhere else in the whole of scriptures. That's unique here. Now, finish this off. Next verse. Okay. Question. Yeah, come on. Just um, wait. So then, banish wait. anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body. For youth and vigor are vapor. Vapor fleeting. You've only got it for a little while. Now, so cast off anxiety or vexation. Um, uh, what's the word? Is vexation now? There's a very common thing that happens when you're young um, is that something goes wrong and you spit the dummy. Uh, okay, uh, uh, you, 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 you exaggerate, your emotions take over. So you go out with a girl, you're disappointed with her, and so you exaggerate that and you become disappointed with and you give up on? Girls. Girls, every girl. And that carries over in many areas. Um, uh, it's, no, it's spitting the dummy, vexation. And that is, doesn't just affect you mentally and emotionally, but it affects you physically. Um, that kind of vexation, that being cross, uh, being disappointed, then you become cynical and uh, disillusioned. And as soon as you're cynical and disillusioned, it affects you physically, but it means that you lose the capacity to enjoy anything. The worst uh, thing that can happen to you when you're young is to become cynical because you've been hurt. Uh, so the thing that bothers me most of all, if I have students in my here at the seminary and say that they're not very well equipped to be a pastor, is if they are cynical. I'm going over time, I know, Tony. I want to finish this now. Okay, um, I've spent, yes, uh, yeah, Garth. Um, with the whole verse 9, with the father ways your heart, whatever you ask yes. to see, and know that for all these things God will bring you to judgment, surely there must be a level where if you overindulge in something. That's right. Well, it's not, it's not telling you to well. overindulge. It's, it's the idea is that what God, it has to do with your lot. Uh, it's what God gives you to enjoy, enjoy. Okay. Um, it's, it's the opposite of that is, is a taking what you enjoy, uh, what you see. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, okay. Right. Okay. Uh, I haven't got time to do the full exegesis of that. But it's the opposite of taking. Now, most of us see things we want or we say, oh, I want this. And you look around and you grab, grab enjoyment. If you grab enjoyment, you never enjoy. The secret of enjoyment is to take what is given. given and to restrict yourself to what is given. So let me just put it most obviously, uh, no, say as a guy, I like women. No way. Uh, <laughs> Shame but, on and, you. And, uh, but God doesn't give me all women to enjoy. No. He gives me one one woman to enjoy and that's my wife so you could take more i could take more yes that's and people do um, but the secret of enjoyment is to receive and to enjoy to find the wife that god has given you to go to your uh, proverb there stephen that you uh, enjoy okay we've gone well over time 
I make no apologies as to, sp well, I am making an apology for spending so much time, but I hope you don't mind. It means that we've got to rush some other stuff, but can you see why this is a favourite for me? Oh, okay. And can you see that it's, it's not just relevant for you, but it's, and people in the church, but it's also relevant for which people? Well, it's wisdom that's relevant it's for It's wisdom for everybody. It touches, say, Australians, I think, where um, uh, they are at and a point they're at. Okay, now, uh, remember that this is one of the festive scrolls. On the one hand, it seems to be one of the gloomiest books in the Old Testament. Vanity of vanities. Everything is fleeting, nothing lasts. But on the other hand, it's one of the most optimistic books in the Old Testament. Uh, it's set to be read at the Feast of Tabernacles in late September or early October, the time of rejoicing at the end of the agricultural year. So, at the end of your work year, now you've got to see that this is read for people who are basically farmers. They've come to the end of their agricultural year. They look back over the year and say, what have we achieved this year? And they look forward to the coming year. So, what this book does is warns about the limitations of work and the true value of work. Can you see why it's placed here at this time? It's the closest that in traditional Judaism is to Christmas for us. You know, the time of holiday, the time of enjoyment. What's the purpose of the, this book? Is to investigate the profit from both mental and physical work on earth. And to encourage God's people to rejoice in their lot and to regard joy as the best gift that God gives to them in this life. Um, the best gift that God gives to them in this life is the gift of joy, enjoyment, rejoicing. And that's a foretaste of heaven. Okay, let's have a break.